Hello and welcome to the Analog Speed YouTube channel. You are seeing this because you have asked for it, so I have obliged my audience's desires and started a YouTube channel. I'm sitting here with my best buddy Kelly, KFD. We're out here in Arizona to talk about his uh, Dodge thing. I'm not even sure what we're going to get into that. He's the Mopar maniac, the most craziest Mopar person I'd ever know. He will tell you every bit in detail any Mopar item or product that's ever been manufactured or even conceptualized or even thought of by those guys. So we're going to take a look at this thing, what we got in front of us here, some other stuff, and tell the story about it. So welcome to episode number one of Car Rants. Here we effing go. Let's do this. All right, cool. All right. So Mr. Kelly, tell us the history of your love affair with Mopar starting from the beginning. So Mr. KFT, tell us again, why are we doing Mopar stuff today? What is this interest, and why should they care? Well, you know, Mopars, especially the Dodge Challenger, has been a lifelong passion of mine. My father actually had a Dodge Challenger, and he sold it when I was 11, and that basically kick-started my desire and my passion to chase down a Dodge e-body dream. And it's been about 25 years now, and it's still going strong. As you can see here, we got a lot of parts for one. Absolutely, I would say so. And what better way to make use of an old rusty block than turn it into a freaking table? That's exactly it. So I see we got a wheel over here. What's the story behind that wheel? Well, so these are what is known as the Mopar Road Wheels. And they're actually manufactured by, uh, by Motor Wheel Division. And Motor Wheel Company actually would make some, some of the 70s wheels, such as the Exciters, which were kind of polyclassed, like the uh, GM, like the GM uh, snowflake wheels with rubberized coating. But they also did stuff like these that were stainless steel. Not only did they make these for Chrysler, they made these for Ford, American Motors, Chevrolet. In fact, you could get a GMC Sprint, which is a GMC El Camino, with these wheels. The only truck you could get that. The only players in the, in the industry in Detroit that didn't have these wheels were Buick, Pontiac, and Cadillac. Everybody else including Oldsmobile, had these things. And me, personally, I'm not that big of a fan of rally wheels. In fact, I'm going to prefer these over rally wheels, so we've got a uh, wonderful 1970 Challenger that's about to be wearing these here real soon. Nice. I like it. So that's almost the modern equivalent of seeing modern manufacturers today all having Enkis. Yes. But, you know, we saw Enkis on all different types of things, from Civics to Pontiac GTOs and the modern iteration Holden Monaros and all different kinds of stuff. And you look on like a GTO and you're like, why does it say made in Japan and Enki? Oh, okay, sure, outsourced wheel. Makes sense. Makes sense. So tell us more about this engine in front of us. What is it? What's the displacement? What year is it? What's it out of? Like, what are we doing? Why, why do we have this engine? Why do we have this engine? Well, to start off, to start off with this engine, we got to jump the DeLorean and go back to 1980. Uh, a certain 1970 Challenger RTSE was owned by an individual named John Kim. And John Kim was, uh, didn't exactly take the best care of his 1970 Challenger that he ordered brand new out of uh, Dodge dealership in Gardena, Inglewood area in, in California. So it blows up. Again, they had just finished producing the 440 a couple years prior to that. So instead of doing the responsible and intelligent thing and going to a junkyard and sourcing a 1970 or early 70s 440 engine, what does he do? He goes to the dealership, and that Challenger got a 1978 truck block with the thinner wall casting, and it had a cast crank. So we rectified oh. the situation. This happened to, now if we jump forward to 1984-85 time frame, uh, some dudes whose first name was Crazy, Crazy Larry, Crazy Mo, Crazy something or other, had a 446 pack GTX. And the interesting thing about that 446 pack GTX was it was actually produced right around the same time that Mr. Kim's Challenger was. Red was produced December 15th, 1969. And Crazy Larry's GTX was uh, right around the same time, right around the same time frame. But the important part is the fact that this engine is in the correct date range consistent with a car built in December of 1969 out of Los Angeles. So that is why this block is here, and yes, I've got the crank and the rods and everything else for it, but right now, it's pulling coffee table duty, and our our favorite little fuzzy counterpart here loves to go and just knock things over. He'll come up here and sniff it and knock it over. So, this is what bachelor pad decor is right here. 
Can't get any better than that. You're not a real man until you've had a fucking coffee table engine block, baby. That's it. That's how we do it here. <laughs> okay. What's next on the agenda? You tell me. You want to talk about the model kit things? We can do that, sure. Do you want to go on to more history about the, the car? Yeah, I, I, can go on, I can go off on the history of the car. Sure. Okay. To like show it, you want me to bring them over? Yeah, sure, you can do that. Which one do you want? Oh? Sure, both of them's fine. Put them there on the table. So, just, just, park them, just park them right there. I say, oh wait, so that's, wait, you know what, that's the CUDA. Here, now, I'll take the CUDA. Okay. Put the CUDA back over here. And... Who's a good fluff nugget? Fuzz butthead. Who's the favorite fuzzy fuck face? Yeah, fuzz butthead. Cool. Yeah, we'll do that. Oh no, she missing a will. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that. Fuck, she's losing a will here too. Alright. So? So now in front of us have appeared a couple of cars. Tell <laughs> us about those. Well, actually, I have to continue on. We have to continue on. So I will t we will get to those. We're still 1984, 1985, Crazy Larry wrapping that tree, or wrapping that Roadrunner. It's GTX around around the tree out here in Arizona. 1989, Mr. John Kim was still driving that Challenger he purchased new 19 years earlier. And he's in Inglewood. And again, the car at that point, someone in 1972, 73 had stolen the RT badges off of it. And so he enlisted the help of his neighbor, Alan, who was armed with pretty much a roller, some scotch Bright. And he painted the car blue, ripped the vinyl top off, used duct tape. My thoughts exactly. Exactly. Used duct tape to mask to mask the car off. So that, so he's driving this this ratty looking very sad Challenger around, and then, so then in night like say in 1989, bang, Challenger dies. Coast to the side of the road, puts it in park, walks to the nearest, uh, walks to the nearest phone booth. Picks up the taxi and leaves the car. Just he's done. Wow. So the city so it sat for a couple days and the city of Los Angeles picked it up and went and deposited it at Mr. Valdry's junkyard, which is now no longer no longer there. Now it's a car auction place and there's all sorts of neat stuff in that place. So then it's nineteen ninety seven. Here I am, I'm starting to get into Mopars and learn about codes and all this sort of stuff. And I remember that my grandmother had like an 84, 85 Lincoln. And it had those big, the big Cartier crystal freaking oh, those yeah. turn signals. And we had to go to the junkyard to get one. Now, I couldn't go to the corporate LKQ yards because at the time, I'm only 14, you have to be 16 to get in there. But we'd go to the smaller ones. So we'd go to Gardena, down Main Street down there. Happened to go into Valdry's junkyard. And these guys, if you can imagine, the dudes from the barber shop in Coming to America, they... they they were straight just lifted from Queens and dropped into this dilapidated craftsman bungalow surrounded by a ton of cars. We're talking BMW Isietas stacked on top of the back half of 58 Corvettes. There had, you had two or three Jensen Interceptors in there. Oh, man. Yeah. And there was a 49, there was, there was a 49 Dodge Coronet. It was right by the office. So we go in there and, you know, my grandpa was asking about this corner, this corner turn signal lens and... He's a gift of gap. Sitting there talking to the guys. I'm going to ask Mr. Valdry. Mr. Valdry, do you have any old Dodges? Oh, hell, son, yeah. There's a 1949 Cornette over there. Yeah, there's a front clip of a 55 D500. This is in 1997. So, and I'm like, well, do you mind if I look around? Oh, hell, son, knock yourself out, kid. So I did. <laughs> so I run through there. I'm a kid in a candy store, and there's a wall of cars stacked up. My grandma's wall of cars and there's a shaft of light and the cacophony of angels singing on this Challenger. And I remember seeing the back there window. Is. There it is. That's right. it. Yeah. I remember seeing the back window, and of course it had a luggage rack on it. It has, it has, a, small, it has a special back window, though. Yes, a smaller back window. And it, has, it, was, it has like a, what's that thing around it's, it? It's a formal back window. Now, if you find a Challenger RTSE or even the A78 formal roof in 71, 
it's not going to have a trunk floor because there's a fiberglass plug that replaces the regular window and they have this smaller executive top style that's right. limousine it's, window. It's so unique looking. That, that's what I, that was the first thing that I saw when you showed me the picture of the yes. car. I was like, that's really cool. What, what is that the weird hell is that a weird window? Yeah, yeah, what is that? What? I mean, the 70s just weren't, weren't good to this car. No, that was a factory thing. <laughs> cool. That was a factory thing. Okay. So, so I see this. I see this car and I see it's, an, it's got the small back window and I'm like, oh, cool. It's a small block Challenger SC because there's no way it's going to be a 440 car. Not in Los Angeles, not in 1997. And I, I get to the back of the car and I kind of check it out. I'm checking out the luggage rack and I get over this side and I look at the VIN. The VIN read JS29UOE126085. Look at this guy. And I'm sitting here and I'm like saying, wow, I wonder what happened to the 440 car that this dash came from. <laughs> Because there's no way this is a 440 car. So I popped the hood. And right on this side, on the, on the inner fender well, on these old Mopars, is basically the car's patents of nobility. I mean, yes, you have the build sheet. LA cars didn't have build sheets. But they have these small business card or credit card sized metal tags that will tell you a code of everything that pertains to the body. So that way the assembly lane workers know that, okay, if I got to put in an A62 rally dash, it has to have a hole drilled for an N85 tachometer. Okay, this is going to have an E63 440. Well, then it's going to need the, the K frame. It's going to need this, this. It's going to need that. All these little things. It's going to tell you the paint code. It's going to tell you it's got this special one. You know, all this sort of stuff. So I look at the fender tag. And I'm sitting there reading the two fender tags in this car, not believing the options of this car. And all the while I'm sitting there saying, holy crap, this is not a 318 car. And But I'm still sitting there thinking, like, God, I wonder what happened to the car that this, you know, the, the challenger donated this. There's no way. Keep in mind, I'm not looking at the engine at all. It's finally until I finish reading the codes or I look up and boom, there is a 440 cubic inch Mopar big block sitting there. And what, is that, what does that relate to in modern terms as far as size? 7.2 liters. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I mean, think about, you think about a, a two liter car, there's almost four times the size of that. And that's actually what this block is. It's a 7.2 liter, 440 cubic inch engine. Now, what uh, diameter are the bores of these? They look pretty big. Huge. 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 Above 100 mil? Oh, yeah. Looks absolutely. like it. Absolutely. I think they're... Beef. I can't remember... I can't exactly remember what the bore is off the top of my head on these. I mean, because I know that... Well, I know that an 18RG is about... You know, it's not... It's not it's 1998? 80, no. See, an 18RG, I think the pistons on that one are 88.5 millimeters. Oh, okay. And, you know, and they're that big compared to that big so but this is this was this was just one of these cars where where uh back back in the day i mean this was this is what detroit was doing it's much like the resurgence we're seeing now with these crazy well you know 800 horsepower muscle cars from the factories this is what the horsepower wars were back then we're back in the 70s it's what can you say we're already that's, ready for it, man. That, that's exactly You saw it. this coming like a bat flying at your head. That's or exactly. maybe a better analogy would be a hubcap flying right at you. <laughs> off of a 49 DeSoto. Oh, God, not that. Right at you. Not man. that. We're back in the 70s again. Back in the 70s. So we got cars rolling out with multiple, multiple hundreds of hundreds of horsepower, inching ever closer to the illustrious 1,000 horsepower from the factory mark. Now, some of those other bullshit cars like that freaking VW thing will do that, but fuck those guys. We got engines. We got real engines. That's exactly it. Hey, don't kick me. Oh, you don't kick me. All right, well, that's cool. So so what, when are you acquiring this car? What is the next step to getting this car? Well, the next step is making sure this car has a place to go to because I, I can't exactly oh, wait, this thing. Wait, hold on. We got we to go back. So you saw it, and then what happened? It, oh, right. What happened to the right. car after you saw it? That's right. Okay, so... You have to put your hat back on and you got to get back into character. Yeah. You can't breathe. Okay. All you right. Got, you can't have the bait beer. Okay. Ham. We're going to get demonetized. <laughs> what about me drinking a beer? Wow. It, it, oh, see, it's turned around. It doesn't say anything. Yeah. It's, it says water. Yeah. Okay. It says can water. Okay. So here we are. So here we are. It's 1997. Of course, I write down, I write down the VIN. I write down the fender tag. All that information. <coughs> So you write it's, down the VIN, you write down the fence, say that again. Yep. So again, it's 1997, so of course I'm looking at this car and everything is there. I mean, it's got cruise control. It's got, it was a special ordered car, cruise control. Any possible option you could think of, you could get on a, a Dodge Challenger in 1970, except for, oddly enough, a passenger side mirror 
and and, and the six way power seats. But other than that, it had everything else. I mean, mirror wasn't required. Mirror wasn't required. But if you're going for everything, I don't understand why you would save three dollars <laughs> on that. But whatever. But I mean, rear defrost, the three speaker dash, the cruise control are all super 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 rare options. And interestingly enough, so so I write all this stuff down. And when I was out there, I was out visiting, because I was living in a small town in Virginia at the time, and I was out in California visiting my grandparents. And one of the things I'd always do is I was always building model cars. So I started off in 1997, that summer, building this car right here. And I just kind of just dug it out. I mean, things, you know, for a little monogram, glued-together model kit that I built as a kid when I was 14, it still held together. That's how so, it starts. You see that? That's exactly yeah. it. It starts from, from, from that right there. So I, so I, kept, so I kept on... I kept on talking, you know, I kept in contact with Mr. Valdry, and, oh, yeah, so I'll say the car, $10,000. So, well, you know, and still. What, what year did you ask him that? That was in 1997. In 97, 97 it was 10 Gs. It was 10 grand. So I saved up my money, mowed lawns, and worked my ass off, and by the time I was 18, 40 years later, I moved out to Los Angeles, because I was going to school out there, and, of course, the first thing I do is I go over to Valdry's to go get my Challenger. And, well, hell, son, your grandfather came by here a month ago and picked the damn thing up. I'm like, what? I realized, no, he thought it was my grandfather that picked it up, but, you know, white people look alike, so that didn't happen. So my challenge was gone at this point, and, and again, I had already kind of achieved slight notoriety. It's, it's really funny I'm saying this, but I kind of had slight, had slight notoriety about the time I was 13, 14. I had written... A comprehensive article on the Dodge Challengers on my little GeoCities website, which was Kelly's Cars back then, on the old GeoCities site, and then it got picked up by a couple, couple different uh, Mopar clubs. Actually, printed printed out in their, it printed out and used my story in their mail out newsletter, which I wish I, I wish I had a copy of that. And then it, it caught the attention of Dr. David Zatz, who ran AllPar.com, and so my my little article that started out on GeoCities with the love of these cars got put on allpar.com and was actually one of the first articles about the Dodge Challenger online. In fact, I think if you get on allpar, it's still, uh, it's still a high, still a pretty high up there in the Google hits. Like, you don't have to go all the way down the page to find to find this. In fact, so you wrote that article I in 97? As, as I, was, I was 14, yep. 14, 15 when I wrote that article. Look at that. He and became still, a journalist at 14. That, exactly, that's exactly And it. you ranked number one on Google before there was Google. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I did. And so Kelly's cars, you know, Kelly's cars continued on, and and the, you know, and again in the early two thousands, I was, I, you know, I, was, I mean, I was, I was heartbroken about about losing that car, and but you know, I had I had my little website, and and luckily enough for me, four years prior to that, I had written down all those codes, and I went, got on, I got on, I got on Microsoft Paint, and I actually made a little pictogram of those fender tag codes. And so I, it was a separate little page on my little GeoCity site, and then of course in 2006 or so is when I migrated from GeoCities to my own dedicated Kelly Kelly's Cars website, and I had that little, and I still kind of did a more comprehensive history of the Challengers, and I had one dedicated just to the RTSE that got away. Red, she's probably crushed in Europe, in Japan, somewhere just the car just vanished. I mean, when I was working, when I was still in the military, I was working for the uh, working for the police force. There is uh, towards the tail end of my last enlistment, so I had every every database, motor vehicle database, at, at my disposal. Anytime I get a really rad cop that would pull me over and sit there and chit chat with him, I'd have him run the VIN on the car. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. So she's gone. So then, two summers ago, I'm dropping the last engine in my. 75 C10 Greenzilla, and I get a notification on Instagram in my DMs, and it was a message request, and of course I almost deleted it because it was just a picture, and, and I but I get this from time to time. You get the spammers, and this guy kind of he only had like like three followers, followed nine people, and like two or three pictures of random stuff. And I had no idea, no idea whatsoever. Who this person was, and of course the the, the spam the spam meter is, is is going off the charts at this point. But you know, I get people who will slide in my DMs all the time because I'll say something on you know, like if, if Mark Warman's yeah. saying something on the Graveyard Cars website or some you know some commentary I'm talking about some car, or when I was working for when I was doing stuff with Antonio Alvandia for Motor Mavens and V8 builds. Of course, I was a big part of that, 
Yeah, I get people that would ask, would you, hey man, I saw you said something on, on their channel. I saw you said something on their site. Hey, can you... From, can yeah, you? from like a long time right. ago. Exactly. And then people remember that. And then and people remember it, that. It's funny because I get the same type of thing. It's like, hey man, do you remember this? And I'm like, what? And so, essentially, you got just like a blast from the past. A blast right? from the past, right. And, and what was it? Continue. What, well, so, so what happens, you know, people will... I'll get these emails or these DMs from time to time. Hey, man, you seem to know about Mopars. Well, I got me a 1973 Cooter. What could you tell me about? Because it all the time. <laughs> pictures, of these, pictures of these rusted out Bondo-laden slant six hulks. You're the, you're the Mopar yeah. seance, right? I, I swear. Yeah. So, I, so I'll, I get this picture of this Challenger. It's like this grayish, gross color. It looks like it was originally red. A little red paint underneath it. And I'm sitting there saying, that's not her. God, that cannot be her. I'm like, what are the fucking odds? And I, and I, of course, I wrote back, wow, man, that's a, you know, a little rad. Because you couldn't see, it didn't have the grill on it. You could see the trapezoidal cutout for a 70 or 71, but you couldn't tell exactly what it was. It didn't have the nose on it. And I'm like, oh, man, that's a 70 or 71 Challenger. That's pretty cool. What can you tell me about it? And all the guy responded back with was, was all the guy responded back with was JS two nine U O E one two six oh five. Wow, that's wow. He, it, so it, this is one of these things where it's almost creepy at that point. And this, he's this, like he read your mind. He's like he knows exactly what to say to he, get your attention. To like and, he's like. I'm just gonna spit this guy the VIN code and he's gonna flip. Oh, oh, I see. And that, that's yeah. absolutely it. I mean, I broke down, but it's kind of funny. It's just this is one of the, one of these strange. A strange thing happened in the way to the forum. The truth is actually stranger than fiction. At this Undoubtedly. Point. So this guy, so Mr. Valdry sold this guy to what who he thought was my grandfather. This dude was 890 11 years old. Well, guess what? In like 2017 or 2016, 2017 time frame, he dies. And the car was sitting in a feed store in Lomita, which is by Torrance. So the car had never really left the South Bay area and left in Los Angeles. That's too funny. So then, so then Challenger Guy, which honestly I don't even remember his name. Like I just know him as Challenger Dude. And he's in my phone as Red Challenger Guy. So yep, yep. Uh, you know, so so Challenger Guy, he buy, so he picks the car up, and then he's he gets on the old Google interwebs machine, types in the VIN, and of course, what's he find? My little website. An article about that my, exact car. My, my little website. And then, and then here's what's even funnier. Here's here's where it, here's where the where the the fate the fate is really funny because at, the, is at that point he bought it. He knew it was a factory 440 RTSE, but when this dude had taken the car half apart because Brett was all together, she was a complete car. He took it apart, kind of started the restoration on it, and he died. And so in the in that meantime, those two fender tags were lost to the sands of time. No idea where the fuck they were. So he didn't have any fender tax work, so he didn't know what was there and what wasn't. But then, all of a sudden, he finds yeah. he finds my little pictograms there you go. with the two with the two those two with the two fender tax. And from there, because I remember there was some paperwork with a guy named John Kim, and in in the glove box. And so I had that written on there. And so from there, he was able to find John Kim, who was still alive at the time, and who gave him the original keys back to the car. Uh, there you go. Now here's what's kind of weird. Is John Kim was he was a Korean garment manufacturer there in South South LA in the fashion district. So he basically wanted to either get a Hemi or a six pack Challenger, and he wanted something that was kind of luxurious, and he didn't really want. And, but so he wanted air conditioning and wanted cruise control and all this sort of stuff. But he got to keep in mind, keep in time, keep in mind, gas back then was like twenty six cents a gallon. This guy was driving once a month from Los Angeles to New York with this car. Nice. And he just wanted, and he didn't. He didn't want. He didn't want a big Chrysler 300. He didn't want a big bomber. He wanted something that was just kind of sporty and kind of upscale. And so the Challenger fit the bill. Exactly. And so, and that's what. And but, but so he orders. So he orders this car with a 444 barrel, and not the six pack or the Hemi, just because of the simple fact that a Chrysler in '70 and '71, you could not get cruise control or. Air conditioning with engines with multiple carburetors, which the Hemi and the six pack have. So, oddly enough, in the hierarchy, in the hierarchy, well, a, a Hemi or a 446 pack might be more desirable. It might be rarer, higher up in the food chain than a 444 barrel. This car kind of trumps those because of the options that it has. So, this is probably one of the most heavily optioned Challengers ever built. Gotcha. So you That's imagine, pretty impressive. So you imagine some cruise control, yeah, right. luxury window thing, oh, right. the power windows, big block, a big block. I mean, and it was just you know it was just a grand tour. Yeah. I mean, you think about you think about what now was it auto or stick? It's auto. 
Unfortunately, it's auto. But well, I'm you know, not what, really the complaining. story actually makes sense then, and it's actually kind of okay because being so unique like that, mm -hmm. and being that it has a special place in your heart, it would Absolutely. it would undoubtedly have a lot of special places in other oh. Park guys' heart too. Right. Simply for the fact that it even was made almost. It oh seems yeah. At this point, it, and when here's the thing, so so. When you break down the Venom prefix, JS29 is going to stand for Challenger RT Special Edition. U is going to stand for 440 four barrel, and then O is going to stand for 1970. And of course, Challengers were built at two different plants, and they were built at the the Linwood plant in Los Angeles, and then there was Dodge Main and Hamtramck. And there were 733 440 four barrel automatic RTSEs built. Now, I don't have the exact breakdown versus Hamtramck and Los Angeles, but from what I understand, there's only about a dozen or so that are made in Los Angeles. So, yep. mm, so it's even even more rare than that. Essentially one rare. of none. Exactly. One of none so, challenger. Look at but, that. But again, I mean, so, but again, it just goes to show that, that that passion, you follow passion hard enough, it'll actually start following you. And one of the things that I've always said is it doesn't matter if the head bolts are three quarters or 19 millimeters, the passion is the same. So, I mean, we can, we can actually shift, tra I'll shift track away from the Mopars for a second, and I'm going to get into to some another story of another vehicle. In fact, something that unified Taylor and I was my little Toyota Celica. Yep. Okay, so the reason we're both here today in this video is to talk about what unites us. It's uh, it's just after Christmas. It's the 26th at the time of recording this video. So we're out here to celebrate cars and freedom and whatnot stuff out here in Arizona. So there was a time when we were both living in Hermosa Beach, California, and we were almost trading off driving a 1981 Toyota Celica that had been through all kinds of ringers. It started off as an original, just factory, plain Jane, automatic, grandma car or essentially what have you right you want a nice little coupe car and it's funny because my grandma had a lift back and in his family there was a coupe and it's like what the heck man so you know i ended up smashing one of my cars into damn near smithereenies and i got to drive that freaking thing for over six months around la <laughs> we're talking it's a was a 22 re when i had it no 22, 22 r, r 22 when i had r. it dual mccune with a 40s yeah. Dual Makuni 40s. The Makunis are actually just off camera, sitting here as decor in my home. They're stashed right behind us, and um, or in front of the. They're stashed right, right behind, behind you, the there, viewer. So it had a header, it had a cam. It was like the craziest 22 or 20 R, whatever R. It was the craziest R series engine I had ever experienced because I had an 85 Celica GTS, and I still have it. It had the 22 RE, which was essentially 135 horsepower on a good day. Oh no, it was like, in, is that, well, 110. So, yeah, it was like, yeah. It was 125 one, actually, one, I think. Yeah, 125. No, it was 113 and 135. That's right, okay. So I actually had an 85 Celica GTS, which in the US came with a 22 RE, essentially the EFI version of the same engine, right? So it was just a 2.4 instead of a 2.2, I think. I can't remember this stupid engine. Those are stupid engines. They're great, <laughs> they're tough, but they're kind of dumb, right? But this yeah. one was cooking. This one was cooking to the point where it should do you think it would this one was cooking to the point where at well, this one was cooking to the point where that car was able to do things it shouldn't do, <laughs> including attain speeds that should not be possible by a like almost 40-year-old car with an old rebuilt engine with a cam in it, you know? So the thing wonky. hauled ass. It was the epitome of one. Yes. Everywhere you go, just, just was, get up and go. It was what Magnus Walker would describe as a car. It was a flat foot car, because you could drive that car everywhere flat footed. Yep. And here's actually, you know what's kind of funny? Is, remember back earlier in the video, I was telling you about how, how my grandfather and I were driving around South LA looking for this one little turn signal thing for my grandma's car, and we ended up finding a 70 Challenger. Yeah. You want to know what car we were driving that day? They were driving the Celica, I yes, bet sir. you. Look at that. Yeah, I can tell you, actually, a more, what's really funny about that Toyota Celica, and this is what I was saying earlier about, about passion, is the Celica was kind of a spare car at the time for us. My grandfather, my grandfather's sister's husband, so the brother-in-law, Bought that car brand new in 1980, 1981, and it was just a regular little car, regular little commuter car. 
my grandfather was still working in downtown LA and then lived out in the sticks in Hermosa. And so his van didn't get the best mileage. It had a 318 in it and it was a conversion van. It was his grand, you know, it was my grandma's limo. So he bought this little car off of, off of Aunt Marge and Uncle Herb and the, they went up to Santa Maria because the car actually sold new at the Toyota dealership in Gardena because that's where they lived was in Gardena. So it was in the South Bay most of his life. Then they moved up to Port Wyneme in Ventura County then moved up to Santa Maria where then it got, it came back down to Hermosa Beach and Fortunately, being by the beach didn't really do any favors and did get a lot of rust on the top side of it. But uh, that thing was looking like Swiss cheese, but it all ass. Yeah, that's it. But so, so anyway, so my you know, so my dad was driving it for a while, and and it was kind of a spare car for them. And then once my grandma got sick in two thousand two, and or no, she got sick in about two thousand six, and she, she they had this brand new two thousand two Buick with twenty five thousand miles on it, and so K Bob started driving that, and the Celica just sat and sat and sat. At the time, I just had my Aprilia RSV Melee, and you know my wife at the time she had a BMW that was a lease return. Well, we needed the car real quick, and I had always kind of liked that thing, and so then we got the Celica. So she was driving it for a while, and then I had the bike, and then we got her another car, and then that was free reign for me to go crazy with the Celica. And I had a vision for it, of, you know, eight spoke wheels and. The you know the JDM stuff you know again in 2012 JDM was really starting to get popular, and that's where I kind of just started learning about the car. And I remember one of the things that was really interesting is I remember in the Haynes manual that you could go get it, you know go get it Pet Boys or Autos yep, or whatever. Yep. There was a whole section dedicated to this weird engine I'd never seen before, and you know it had. It, it, it showed how to adjust the cams, and it had these cool-looking, weird carburetors on it, and this whole stuff. And I, you know, I knew a little bit about a little bit about about cars, yeah, a tiny bit. Mostly, my love was was Mopars. I had a stupid little Fiat X19 for a hot second, but mostly my my thing was yeah, CRX. Uh, the CRX. Yeah. I did have the CRX. They had a lot of different types in a short of, period, more or less. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did. I did. And so, and so. The, the, the Japanese cars were kind of a whole entire new thing, but that's, it's just, it was one of those things where it was rear wheel drive, which was cool, and it was kind of a two plus two. If you really essentially it is. think about it, it is a two plus two. You think, you, you, think, you think about what the market segment was in 1981 for this car. Well, you know, the Celica was developed as a personal, a personal luxury, luxury car. car. Which is really weird because at the time Toyota had so many different mm -hmm. versions of like sport luxury combinations. Mm hmm. But, you know, the one that we really got in the U.S. and the one that kind of subsequently fell into our hearts and minds for, for a long time, you know, was the Celica was platform. The Celica. Right. It's like, why did my grandma buy a, a brand new 81 GT liftback and she drove around L.A. with her freaking poodle? Cause it was she a, just it was, wanted like a round the town little thing and, and it, it, was, it was it was light, exactly it had light. enough room, it, it was, was great easy, to it drive. Was maneuverable, it got yeah. great mileage, and plus it was a Toyota. They run and run and run and run and run, yep. run. Even in stock form, you can have so much fun with it that you don't even have to touch it. That's exactly it. Here's the thing. What's really fascinating is if you look at a 19, we'll say a 1980 or 78 to 81 Celica, this RA40 generation, and look at the 79 to 82 Dodge Challenger, because a lot of people, a lot of people forget that the new Challenger isn't the second gen; it's the third gen. So, for a while, the Challenger existed as as a captive import. It was actually a rebadged Mitsubishi Scorpion. That's right. And you look with at the, the Scorpion 2 .2, with the right? two point two yeah. or the two point six, but you look at the Scorpion; it looked identical to this car, and it was the exact same market segment. So you imagine if Mr. John Kim. When instead of buying a new Challenger in 1970, he bought something in 1980. Chances are he would have bought something like that. And now, do you know where this one was designed, though? It was actually designed at Cal T Research exactly. in El Segundo, California. Exactly. So David Stollery was actually the, the chief stylist involved for the Celica, and again heavily influenced because he had a lot of buddies that worked on the DeLorean at the time too. So if you ever notice some a, angularity, a of angularity. Of course, yeah. that was kind of the standard. The standard. Styling rate at that point. David Stollery was actually a former Mouseketeer from the original season, and he's still, even to this day, does does a lot of industrial design things. He's still doing. I mean, guys, you know, guys probably he's a has, hustler. Yeah, he's probably. I mean, he's probably in his in his seventies now, late eighty or late seventies, early eighties. But again, if you look, perfect example. So you go down to Caprio Beach, you see the, those fiberglass those fiberglass lifeguard towers. He designed those. 
Interesting. So, so yeah, and again, this is part cool. of that part of that passion of I, you know, I found him and I was I started doing a, comp- a comprehensive history. <laughs> so on these so he gets too. the car, he gets the car, and then he finds the guy who freaking made the design for the car and just starts harassing. Start, him. I start started picking his brain, and exactly. so you, that's how you find the source of the information. And, and that's exactly it. And here's what's 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 really fun. What's really fun for me is learning about the car. I mean, I, this essentially was a was a, a you know the Jap, Japanese cars were a tabula rasa for me. I didn't really know that much about them. And then all of a sudden, again, it was like 2010, and then all of a sudden, you know, four years later, I'm in Okinawa and I'm chasing everything down. And that's where the old school JDM Hunter hashtag on on Instagram came from because I was and you were in, you were in Okinawa on deployment, I was right? On Okinawa on deployment. There, so I he's out hunting Japanese cars. Japanese cars out there. In his spare time yeah. out there, right? Out there. And that's yeah. exactly what it was. And I, and, and so. I mean, one of some of the neatest things I saw was that there was a, a 330 Cedric two-door that I saw abandoned in Okinawa, and, and that's super, that's 1970 Challenger 440 RTSE rare. Again. So, so yeah. and again, but you, you, see, you see these things, and part of, the, part of the fun for me with these cars is, again, was, is learning about them. And for sure. And it, it's, it's, it's part of that chase. I mean, you always have one eye trained off, off in the yard seeing what else is in there, because you never know what it could be. Nope. It could be... Um, you know, it, it could it could be a ZZ, it could be a yep. what is a, the ZZT two twenty five we saw today, FC sixty nine Camaro. There's still stuff out there. In fact, yesterday we saw a an A fifty three AAR Cuda sitting on top of a shipping container. It was and cut what, in half. Yeah, it was cut in half. Cut in half. Oh. So these things are still out here. But anyway, yep. so so. Continue on. I'll continue on with the story about about the Celica. And it's just you start. Well, I, for me. Half the fun is learning about the car. The other half, the other half of the fun for me is trying to hunt parts. And with modern, with these, with these, the domestic muscle cars, it's pretty easy to go on year one, OPGI, any of these other companies, and get, get a Taiwanese all these, fender in three hours or less. Exactly, and you don't almost build those cars. But for these, it's a little different. I mean, in Los Angeles, there's only about 50, 50 or so of these left. Yeah, and you cannot just buy parts. You can't buy parts. You can't buy parts from Toyota. No. You're going to have a hell of a time from Rock Auto alone. No. Yeah. You can't go out and get a Fender. It just doesn't just, exist. They, there they was just, never that demand. They just don't it exist. It became their own kind of cult following, but it was a lot different than the muscle car type of following, you That's, know, where people are willing to spend money more easily because for a long time these cars really weren't worth anything. Yeah, they were just disposable cars. And, they all got crushed in the 90s. Yeah, and so these were all just car it was these were all just car crushed fodder. But people that still had them, they they loved them and they held on and they and they held on to them. That's why there's some of these cars still still around today. What's funny is again for me, half of the excitement of the building the car was sourcing the parts. And again, I'm in Okinawa, Japan, and of course, over there, you're going to find all sorts of neat stuff. And there was that weirdo engine that I saw in the Haynes manual. But I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So over here, over here in America, we got the 20R and the 22R, and it's basically a little four-cylinder hair dryer. There was the same 22R that you saw in a pickup truck, and that was really about it. The pickup truck and the rear-wheel drive Celicas were the only vehicles that got this engine, and they're pretty anemic. Let's let's be real. They are. They are. But you know what? They they run forever. I mean, the R series engine ran from 1953 to 1995, and and they also run without oil. And they also run without oil. Yes, and but, you can fix the starter on one by hitting the shit out of it. Yes, you can. So, turns out that engine, that engine that we never got over here, is known as the 18RG. And the 18RG is is very special because if you're into Toyotas, you're automatically going to start mouth breathing over the. AE86 Corolla with its with its 4AGE dual head cam engine. The 4AGE had a head designed by Yamaha. And now, what paved the way for that 4AGE to exist were the previous iteration of dual cam engines like the 18RG and the 2TG, and even the 3M that is in the MF10 2000 GT of the late 60s. Now you see, Yamaha had actually started. They wanted to. They wanted to build a a, a really neat two seat kind of Jones tour hot rod. In fact, this would have been something up Mr. Cam's alley if it had a back seat. And so they first solicited the idea to to uh, Nissan. Of course, Nissan was more intent on their their merger with Prince, which meant they would get the Skyline car car line. They would also get the S twenty engine with the cross flow head. So they so they said go fish. 
So then Yamaha went to went to Toyota, and of course we have the MF10 2000 GT, and the rest is history. But so here's here's a common a common misnomer is that in in the engine prefix after 1970 or 71 when they kind of changed things around, everybody always assumes that the E I'm sorry the G in any engine 2JZ GTE means Yamaha head. It actually means dual cam. But right. every dual cam has always been has, always been, has yeah. been engineered by Yamaha. So this 18RG performance dual cam before dual the cam. advent yes. of right. the more commonplace, right. more commonplace. Uh, the more pedestrian right. cam engines, That's which right. were only the result of messing around with sports cars. Sports cars. That's exactly. Toyota right. had no reason to do that. They would they would have been happy to keep with an 8R oh. and a 3KR and, and everything. Oh yeah, and then so a little RT40 Corona with it. So an additional this. fun fact. Additional fun fact about the uh, the four uh, AG. So an additional fun fact about the four AG was actually built off of the designs of a Ford race engine. Interesting, like a Cosworth. The architecture of the block and like the overall design is almost identical. I think it's a YF or YZ. I can't remember right. what, but it's a Ford Cosworth kind of like actual race engine, and that's one of the reasons why it does so well that's... and is able to perform at such that level. Where you, uh, whereas you look at other engines like around that same time frame have kind of more or less died out like the 1G GTE was yeah. released yeah that one didn't do so it's high kind of a slug anyway. and there was a whole bunch of other ones like that but you know at that time period it was the advent it was before the advent of the four valve heads mm -hmm. so at that time two in the 70s heads. with the 18RG it was only a two valve head right. which is fine but the race engines of that time were four e. valve heads. Yes, 152E. And those Woo! engines were like over Absolute 245 screamers. horsepower out of two liters in 1973, yeah. which all the way up to 80, almost like 83 or 84. 83. We, with that efficiency was just was just unheard of. I mean, you got to remember that we were, you know, for for. I mean, God, it was, they were making flathead engines up until the mid-60s. Oh, man. So you think about that. The, you know, the Rambler had the flathead, the same flathead 6 in 1964 that it had in 1936. Wow. So you look at that, when you look at that technology, it also goes to speak about, ja about the Japanese car industry in general. Because, I mean, it was decimated after the war. So basically, they didn't have the resources or the capital to, in to do their own in-house engineering. So a lot of times, they copied stuff. Perfect example of this, if you look at, like, the... I can't remember the engine that's in the uh, the uh, uh, the Datsun Fairlady 2000 Roadster. It's literally a copy of an Austin engine, yeah. and they actually so they and they had a couple other ones. They did they copied off. They got licensed copies of of Austin and Morris, and the other interesting one, the Toyota 2F. It was in the Land Cruiser. Now keep in mind the whole Land Cruiser came about as at the request of the U.S. military during wow. during the Korean War because they realized it would be just easier. We'll just have these guys. We'll just have Toyota build us, build us this, you know, this 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 Jeep, J yep. Jeep. So what? So what did they do? So they took the old Chevy, the old Chevy M line six. I want to say it was a stove, the old stove bolt six. It might have been the updated one. And they basically said, okay, let's take the let's take the six, enhance, scaled it up, and that's literally what the two F was. It was just an up. It was just a scaled up, wow. the old scaled up two thirty five. Chevy straight six. Interesting. So, and you, but you look at that. So anyway, going back to going back to now, Toyota is trying to assert itself in the automotive market as a key player, and they released a Halo car, much like they did with that Lexus LFA. Its true predecessor was the MF10 2000 GT. This is the James Bond car. Yamaha did all the all the wood inside it. This engine, you know, Yamaha designed the head, and they actually reused. All the hardware and all the architecture for the 18RG, the 2TG, and the Yamaha XS650 Seika 2 motorcycle. Now, the Seika 2 motorcycle, it, it had it was it had, it had a chain drive in the middle of the cams. And there's something else different about it. Like I thought, the sh maybe it didn't have Shimon bucket. I think it actually had adjusters, but the Shimon bucket, the valves, everything, springs, collets, keepers are the same for the 2TG, the 18RG. And the 3M engine. So, so pretty much any pretty much, way to twin cam of that pretty, era. Pretty much any, yes, exactly. And so it's kind of funny. Some of my antics that I've had over in Okinawa was part of the fun of building my little Celica. And I met some really amazing people. And it's it's pretty interesting because the thought, or I should say the passion for vehicle, kind of transcends 
cultural cultural lines. It transcends language. And one of the things I thought was really interesting was I had found a factory airbox from Australia. I had it found it on eBay, and it went from and it went from Australia to Okinawa. And I went over to a little shop called Taki Motorsports, and they're in Okinawa. And Tatsuya-san had a lot of Skylines, had a Skyline Japan, a couple Camarys, had some Turbo Mark II chasers, or Turbo Mark IIs, all sorts of rad stuff. But anyway, I was gonna have him in a wheel collection to die for. So, I was gonna have him paint this airbox, this, this little plinth. And on these cars, they have a second, they actually have a canister with the air filter element in it, a little accordion tube, and then they actually have a plenum that will clamp onto the side of the air of the airbox. And someone had did a really, really bad job of metal work. Well, I took that airbox over to Tetsuya Sun and I had him paint it. And I was with one of my friends and he had limited English, I had limited Japanese, but we were able to communicate pretty well. And he said, uh, Do you have the other the other part of the airbox, which was the actual air filter element? I said, no, I'm going to probably just use one from a later Celica, like an RA60 Celica that's carbureted and it has, because it has that air box that kind of goes off in the corner. And he looks at me and he says, you, you get my car, let's go. And he had this little tiny Honda. I mean, it was a little K car, which are probably smaller than a Miata. And we started zooming along these roads in Okinawa. And some of these roads are about as wide as this couch without, without the chase sectional part. We're doing 60 in this little, this little road, zooming around. And I have no idea what the hell's going on. I barely know who this guy is. And here I am in a strange land doing questionably illegal things in this car. And all of a sudden, we pull up to this pile of rubble. And Tetsu is like, oh my god, this was a building yesterday. This was one of my old garages. I can't believe it. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what the fuck we're doing here, but okay, whatever. And so Tetsu is kind of kicking around. And there was like... I found parts of an HKS blow-through box for the L28 or the L-series Nissan engine, which I thought was really cool. I mean, we're talking, this is, this is Wongan Midnight Dream parts. And then all of a sudden, out of the mud, Tetsuya picks up the air cleaner element for an 18RG. Well, actually, this one was for a 2TG out of a Corolla, but it was the air cleaner element. So I couldn't believe, what are the freaking odds of that? And... Um, so I thought that was really cool. So I actually ran that for a couple of years, and then of course, through the Celica group, I had Yoshikazu, Mr. Yoshikazu Korai over from Japan, and he had a beautiful garage, and he had a beautiful Celica. And so he, he I was talking to him one day on Facebook, and he's like, hey, kelly son, I have a factory air cleaner that has that, because you've got this goofy looking Corolla box on there. Why don't you go get this, go get the factory element? I have one in my garage, it's taking up space, I don't have a lot of space, I'm in Japan. He says, you pay shipping, so I paid, you know, hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars for shipping, and four, four or five days later, this thing came from Hokkaido to Los Angeles to Ventura. I had the factory correct air cleaner for my car, and it was really interesting because you have that passion, you have that charisma, you're really excited about something. Again, it transcends, it transcends language barriers, and it's funny, like, Tetsuya, with all these cars, he saw me just excited about this stuff, and I remember him kind of making the motion that I was like bouncing off of my excitement, I was bouncing off the rev limiter, looking at all these cars, especially the Kid Mary and the, the, Mark, the, the twin turbo Mark IIs that he had and all this really, really cool stuff. And it goes to show, it circles back to what I was saying about your passion, whether your head bolt's 19 millimeters or three quarters, the passion is the same. And sometimes we gotta deal with our neighborhood Karen HOA watch. So here I am in I'm Okinawa. I'm, a, I'm the for our, our CV battalion. I was a small engine guy, so I had my own little shop. Nice. And I was just building small engines. And so my my direct superior, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander Lieutenant Commander Talmadge, he is the biggest. He's a big gearhead like I am. And so that's the only reason why this happened. But I found on Okinawa Buku, which is essentially uses the same API and programming and coding as Craigslist. Found a civilian contractor out there that had an 18RG. In fact, I even got to drive that thing. It was an RA29 and it pulled like a freight train, but it, had, it literally had, I, I literally had a 2x4 across the floor because it had no floor. The thing was rusted up. Rusted wow. all. But it ran. 
And so I freaking got so delivered the engine right to my shop. The in, me and my losing commander. He, he's like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. There you go. And so I made some drug deals. And and when when a CV battalion is going to go anywhere on deployment, they're going to have a shipping container go first with your Xbox and your bicycles and even you have these big gorilla boxes. And officers are officers are allotted four hundred pounds. I think I'm listed as like two hundred. But if you can talk very very nicely to to make friends with the guys in the embark crew that does all this you can sneak about 400 pounds home now an 18 rg dressed out without fluids in it weighs about 380 pounds so i took the exhaust manifold and i actually sent that snail mail home i sent a couple parts snail mail home and then got that crate put it in there and then of course wheels and uh, snuck snuck some what knobby wheels home uh, there's a naughty wheel up here on the wall that uh, that came home as well. Yeah. And up until that point, there was no restrictions on taking automobile engines home. You couldn't take, you couldn't buy a boat motor, and take it home. You couldn't buy a motorcycle and take it home. Couldn't buy an airplane engine. That you couldn't take it home. But you could take a car engine home. And so now, as a result, in the naval construction force, they have the petty officer doke law, where. Look at yeah, that. He made his own rule. He made my own rule. Can't but bring yes. an engine back now. Can't bring an engine back. Thanks I, a lot, Kelly. I know. I know. Sorry. Sorry there, CVs. But so I had the 18RG, and at that point, I mean, I rebuilt it. And I, in fact, the thing was, this was not the first engine in my living room that 18RG was. That's there's pictures, right. You know, there's, I remember there's that. pictures. There's pictures of this thing sitting behind, stuck behind the couch in my, in my. In I my mean, hey, both kind of tables are cool. A twin cam toilet engine and a big block part. That's and exactly it. We'll take it. That's cool, man. But yeah, but I, but that motor, put it together, and I got it. You know, I, you know, I was behind the original automatic in the Celica, and it wasn't exactly the fastest. It was automatic. only like 135. Yeah, yeah. Max 18, on a good right. day in stock form. Exactly, and it was an 18RGU as well, so it still had the all the pollution stuff, and I wanted to make this thing pass. For California, so that was a little bit difficult. That's too. a noble venture. Yeah, it really was. So, word to the wise here: if you guys have an older car in California, just go pay to get a dirty smog. It's cheaper. It's a better use of your time. Dirty because, smog. Yeah. Montana can eat it out of yeah. state. Don't worry. Exactly. Or just move to. Or just all move. you gotta do is know a guy or message us. Actually, yeah. no, don't message don't us. Don't message us. We don't know anything about that. All you gotta do is know a guy, or move to Arizona, or move to Arizona. That's where. That's where it is. Move to Arizona. So here I was, I was driving, had the motor together about a week. I might have been driving hard, just kind of cruising, cruising along, tat, 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 bang. So basically what happened was I had taken the car, so I would taken the carburetors and I actually had a pump jet clock incorrectly. And if you look at a cross section of one of these pump jets on a Makuni carburetor, they're actually D-shaped. Mm. So that way the nozzle is flowing, is flowing, it's atomizing correctly into the throat of the carburetor in the Venturi. Well, I didn't do that, and it was kind of running on the wall and not at atomizing. So it was running super, super lean. So uh -oh. what happened, the, val the, the, the valve guide was super heated. Just burnt. And burnt it, and then it was just like the space shuttle across Nagadoshi's County, and it just kind of started falling apart. And so I pulled the engine off, because I was only doing 270, like, oh shit, pulled the engine off, and this valve was, this is the intake, the intake valve was stuck like that. The exhaust valve looked like a 2,000 year old Roman coin. You can still see the little <laughs> Yamaha tuning fork. But, so you live and learn. So I we got another 18RG and didn't get it together. So I built a 20, I bought a, a wheezy old 20R. That had, rebuilt that thing. Oh, uh, well, no. Well, actually, then, yeah, well yeah. actually, no, that one I didn't no. rebuild. That one was, that one I paid, I picked up. From a guy out in Fontana for like three hundred bucks, had four hundred fifty thousand miles on it. In next year's prices, these are all double. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And this truck, this came out of a truck, and the truck literally fell apart awesome. around the engine. The engine was fine. The car had the thing had so much blow by, I and mean, they barely do seven miles an hour. Hell, it ran. So I threw threw it in, threw it in, and away I went. And then of course, I started collecting parts for another twenty two R. I was going to do a, a, I was actually going to do a twenty R E sort of thing, take or, or a hybrid take a 20R head on that 22R block, and I started collecting the 8283, or actually it was 83, the early fuel injection setup. Because I was gonna do fuel injection on the 18RG as well, I'm like, well, I'll just start collecting all this fuel injection stuff, so that For way sure. I can just, just convert swap. Over, yeah. yeah, I can convert everything over, and I can use my injectors and yep. the wiring harness and all sort of stuff, and then that turned into another carbureted 
pink block with a 6500 thumper cam. As we know and enjoyed it. As we know and enjoyed it. Yeah. And it. then unfortunately the story took a little bit of a turn then after that once I was done with the car. Yeah. Gave it back to Kelly over here and uh, you know sometimes things are out of your control and that one ended up biting the dust which we were not going to go into detail on that because it's a tragic circumstance <laughs> for something that we love. But well, you know, it lived on for a hot minute, and uh, uh, all it, we can say at this point is it is no longer part of this earth, but it is definitely a part of our hearts. And the good thing is, though, is it's helping other Celica survive. That was another, a bit. another one will live on due to the sacrifice it has made, but it surely has served us it, well. It, it, I'll, I'll tell you, that was just a bad week entirely for me because, oh, was, yeah. because that's that how was, it happens. It's that, always like one one crappy was, week, and then just well, that was on a Sunday. I go up to Azusa Canyon, and I, I might have been been driving like a buffoon on some not so good tires but I'm gonna go up and take the car driving and keep in mind in 2017 I just bought I bought a 2015 Challenger again because I could not find the red RTSE so I bought a red 15 Challenger and the Celica was just now relegated to just kind of weekend toy status and I drive it every now and then I have, but you know okay whatever it's fine I was uh, coming back from Lake Havasu I was because I had a job interview out there and I hit a coyote doing 135 miles an hour and so the car, the Challenger, had to go in the body shop and get its, its nose built, rebuilt. Nose job. Got a nose job. It's okay. I got the I got the Celica, so I started driving a little Celica around again. You know, it's running all over Orange County and meeting up friends up in Azusa Canyon, and that's when I overshot a corner and and destroyed the car. That's okay. You know what? So the Celica is now down. The Challenger's on the body shop. I have my motorcycle. I'm good. So four days later. Someone pushed me into a K rail and I ended up in the hospital for like five days. So it was not a bad. That was not a good week for me. For me in vehicles, to say the least. But at least, at least um, you know I'm alive. And like I say, the Celica, it's gonna live. It's 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 lives on. That pink 22R is, yeah, it's it's in a truck now up in Bakersfield. And uh, you know one of my one of my buddies who actually found the pictures of the car on Pinterest, bought a Celica of his own. He got in the community. And that's how I knew him. And he always loved my car. And then when he heard that, that my car got totaled, he's like, "Dude, I'll, I'll buy it." And so I'm like, "Okay." But I took off. I took off my my Nardi wheel. I took off my Makuni carburetors, and I sold the sold the Watanabe's. A guy, you know, a guy has one on his eight six now up there, and he's 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 a regular Canyon bony up in his. So now. parts of the car lives parts on. Parts of the car lives on. And it's still so, in our hearts, folks. That's, so that's, that's exactly more or less the story for right now. Thank you for watching our first episode of Car Rants on the Analog Speed Channel. Check out my buddy Kelly KFD. I'm KFD on Instagram. Kelly's Cars. Kelly's yeah. Cars on YouTube. So it might be. Uh, so look forward to the next episode. We don't know where we'll be. We don't know what we're going to be talking about. But we hope to keep you entertained. And thank you for watching. Like and subscribe. Like